I'll tell you about a little project I'm working on. It's a long-term uh, time lapse. Uh, and of course, to do a long-term time lapse, you need to be able to keep your camera in the position for quite a long time and also control your camera. So that's what I have here. I've built a uh, custom time lapse controller. Uh, it's based on an Arduino Uno. Um, and it allows you to control uh, the start and stop time uh, based on time of day as well as the day of the week um, in my case it's a construction project and uh, they're not going to be working weekends so I don't want to have to be taking frames on weekends when nothing's happening uh, so this can be set to uh, only uh, take frames uh, during weekdays only on weekends or uh, start and stop at a specific uh, day of the week for instance you can start it at noon on a Tuesday and end uh, at 3 p.m. on a Wednesday so the LCD screen is a 16-character, two-line LCD screen. It's based on the HD44780. Um, these are extremely cheap. You can get them on eBay um, for almost nothing. Um, I believe this one is about five dollars. Uh, it's uh, LED backlit. It has a green LED backlight. You can also have white and blue LED backlights, but I figured green was just fine. It's uh, nothing very fancy. Uh, Four buttons to control your menu of up, down, enter, and escape. There's a green LED to show you that the time lapse is currently running, and a blue LED that blinks every time uh, the camera takes a shot. On the side here, you have the 2.1 millimeter DC jack um, for anywhere between 5 and 30 volts. There's an internal voltage regulator. And then a 3 pin uh, mini XLR connector that goes out um, to the camera. So it's a uh, look at the inside of this and it is quite messy because it is uh, is not a printed circuit board it's just point to point and I didn't have any connectors so everything is literally soldered directly onto the board this is the tiny RTC module uh, it's a uh, DS1307 based um, real-time clock you can see well, crystal oscillator there and on the other side it has um, the, the 2032 coin cell battery so that this is actually still keeping time even though it's uh, completely unplugged from the main circuit a uh, little 0.1 inch uh, pin header here um, this uh, communicates to the Arduino over I squared C so there was an issue um, uh, described on the internet there was a um, problem when you would disconnect main power that it wouldn't save um, wouldn't actually save the time that you set for it uh, there's a uh, there was a library written by a gentleman from Colombia Marvin Javier Villamizar um, that fixes this problem uh, it's a fairly simple library and it does all the stuff that the regular DS1307 library does but it actually works with the tiny RTC module the tiny RTC um, it was very cheap. It was about two dollars eighty cents uh, shipped to me uh, on eBay. It did take a little bit to get here. Um, not sure where it was coming from. Uh, I think it was coming from stateside. Um, it would be even cheaper if I got it from China, but I didn't have you know two months to wait uh, for it to come in. All right, inside the main case, you can see uh, the Atmel AT Mega three twenty eight, which is. Uh, burned with the Arduino bootloader. Uh, there's a 60 megahertz crystal, two capacitors. There's a white LED for power, along with the resistor. Uh, filter caps for the power input, both on the input and output side. Um, after the uh, uh, after the voltage regulator, which is hidden down here somewhere. Uh, this is a uh, an NEC opto coupler, which uh, is actually how the the uh, camera is being triggered. The remote port on the camera has three pins, uh, a shutter pin, a half press or autofocus shutter pin, um, and then the ground pin. And the ground and shutter pin have to be shorted to each other uh, in order to take a frame. And instead of doing that through the Arduino itself and potentially uh, blowing something up, um, uh, running it through an optocoupler is um, the best practice. Also this optocoupler was cheap because it was free, I pulled it out of a uh, Power Mac G5 uh, power supply. Actually, I had a dead power supply sitting around, and they just happened to have three of these conveniently uh, right in a row. So I took them all off, uh, and I got a free component out of it. 
So down on the bottom here, I have an LM7805 uh, five volt linear regulator, uh, and that's clamped to uh, quite a large bar of aluminum. These do get a little bit warm, especially if you're powering it with uh, a, a high voltage source. Um, my voltage source is 12 volts nominal, so about 13 volts. Behind this mass of wires right here are the, uh, the switches. These are the buttons on the front panel. Uh, and each one of the, well, three of these have a resistor soldered onto them. Um, that means that I can essentially have four buttons uh, controlling the Arduino from just two wires. Uh, as you can see, these four switches are wired to each other and then come out just uh, a negative and a positive, or in this case, uh, a negative, and the red goes to one of the um, analog pins on the Arduino. That's then read in software. Um, because each of these uh, buttons then will obviously transmit a different voltage level uh, to the analog pin. Uh, the Arduino program reads what voltage it is, and if it's in a, a certain range of voltages, then I know which button I've pushed, essentially. Uh, it's a really easy way to do a, a many, many buttons on only one pin of the Arduino. Back of the board is where this gets interesting. This is all uh, on a solderable breadboard, um, which means that everything is point-to-point -point wiring. Um, I was able to add in uh, some buses just using some solid core 24-gauge uh, wire. Uh, so this is the negative, this is the ground bus, um, and then I believe that I have a positive, yeah, there's a positive rail uh, somewhere over here. Um, it is messy, and it was my mistake. Uh, so when I was in prototyping uh, on the Arduino board, it made sense that uh, I would go, uh, you know, Arduino pin one goes to LCD pin one, or you know, whatever makes sense, because it, they're on the Arduino board. They're in order, and they're obviously in order here on the uh, LCD connector. The problem is on the AT Mega um, 328, the pins aren't in order. Um, and that makes it very difficult. That's why I have all of these wires crossing each other. You can see it's quite the lump of wires here. So if I were to do this again, I would look um, at the spec sheet for the um, AT Mega um, 328 and plan it out a little better so that these pins are as straight across, or you know, as as straight across as possible. Um, as long as the digital pins um, are the ones being used uh, for the digital transmission uh, to the uh, the LCD screen. Um, it doesn't matter really what pin you use. Uh, I am using one uh, PWM pin on here to do the LCD backlight. That's a separate thing. The, the LCD backlight and the communication to the LCD are completely separate circuits. The LCD backlight is simply two pins, uh, positive and negative, uh, for the LCD. So I can run one off of a PWM pin, which means that I can um, turn the backlight on and off and even dim it um, it's not implemented yet, the, the, the dimming of the backlight's not implemented yet, but it is a possibility, that's why I did that instead of just wiring it right into the battery, uh, or, or right into the 5-volt uh, uh, supply voltage. So when you're turning on, you're greeted with the clock, which is the time of day, and it is actually correct, um, and then the, uh, the day of the week, and then the date, um, the backlight turns off after 10 seconds of inactivity. Uh, so you navigate here, you have really only two menus, setup and um, run status. Uh, and then back, oops, back to, if you hit escape, the red button, it'll get you back to the clock, the time of day clock. So under setup, um, you have set time of day, so you can set your clock. If you hit escape, you'll get out of that and go to your start time. Uh, so start time right now is every day at uh, 2.43. Let's make it uh, every day at uh, 2... 20 and then you can of course set uh, a day do it only on weekday weekdays weekends and daily and you can have it end uh, at a certain time then you have uh, hours minutes and seconds so you can go uh, up to 59 minutes uh, 24 hours 59 minutes and uh, 59 seconds. So right now it's set to 5 uh, and you can see it's actually running 
a blue LED will blink every five seconds. So I can turn it up to 10 seconds, let's say, or down, let's go down to two seconds. So every two seconds, it'll blink. And those changes take place right away. Uh, the changes are also stored in EEPROM. Uh, so when you power this down and turn it back on, it saves your settings. Uh, under run status here, it tells you if it's running and it also counts how many frames it's taken. So every time it counts a frame, every time it takes a frame, it counts up. So besides the time-lapse controller and the camera, there's also a power supply for the camera. It's an uninterruptible 12 volt power supply and a nice case to put the camera in so I can leave it outside as long as I want to. It looks like this project's going to be about three years long, so I really want this camera to be protected, so I'd have to go out there as little as possible. So let's take a look at those. So here's the case that I built. It's a Pelican 1300. Um, this one I got on eBay for a steal. It was only about $25, I think, um, which is good because I drilled a whole bunch of holes in it. This is what it looks like all built. Um, with the camera and the time-lapse controller inside of it. Uh, the time-lapse controller is a little bit tall, so that uh, mini XLR connector um, does, this cable gets a little bent up. Um, I might move those connectors to the other side of the case, um, but um, it works for now. Uh, it is quite a tight squeeze in there. This, uh, this 24 to 105, uh, if we take this lens cap off, this is able to zoom all the way in without touching uh, the front of the case there. So I will be able to get full zoom uh, from 24 to 105 uh, with no problem at all. Right now this is mounted to the desk with a Mafer clamp and a uh, Manfrotto 496 RC2 ball head. Uh, this is probably going to be final configuration for it. Uh, how it will be attached um, when it's installed. It's going to be clamped to a handrail uh, up at the top of, a, of an apartment building on the roof. This is a Switchcraft uh, Con-X, uh, mini Con-X uh, two-pin connector. The reason I got it is it is waterproof. So this is a, this is a waterproof connector when made. It's IP65 or 67 or something rated, uh, which means that uh, it's watertight. Uh, when mated. Uh, in fact, I think it's watertight right now as well uh, because it is, it's mounted from the back of the panel um, and there's a rubber o-ring on the other side of it so no water should get in even if it's not mated. I get a little closer look at the inside of this Pelican case with no camera in it. Up at the top we have the power inlet and just a, a little zip wire that goes to uh, a crudely assembled um, uh, essentially power splitter. There's a uh, two 2.1 millimeter jacks. One is for the uh, camera power supply and one is for the uh, time-lapse controller power supply. This is on a piece of plastic. It's actually the plastic that I cut out for the window of the uh, LCD screen. Uh, down here at the bottom I have a uh, it's a uh, Manfrotto RC4 quick release plate and that's just bolted straight through the bottom of the um, of the Pelican case. This allows me to take the camera in and out of the case because um, you need to swap cards you know every so often and the case itself isn't wide enough to allow me to uh, get the CF card out uh, with the camera inside. On the back side of this case here I've uh, taken a piece of aluminum uh, and bolted it through the bottom because this plastic is quite flexible uh, and this plate itself, this is an RC2 plate uh, uh, a Manfrotto RC2 plate this footprint is quite small especially compared to the RC4 plate uh, I could only find uh, a ball head that had the RC2 plate I didn't, couldn't find one at the right price point that had an RC4 um, so this worked just fine, this piece of aluminum which is some scrap I had laying around uh, and it was just just about the right size uh, to cover you know this uh, area between these ribs. And over here we have the case uh, that the battery is stored in. This is a, a Hardig case. Uh, it was originally uh, modified by Kinemetrics. They do um, seismic uh, equipment, seismic reading equipment. Um, so I got this uh, surplus for pretty cheap, it's about forty bucks. Uh, so there's a bunch of holes and uh, connectors already on it. Uh, this one's very nice. This is a uh, a waterproof uh, multi-pin connector. So I'm just using uh, the first two pins there for power. 
is a universal battery, uh, 90 amp hour, 12 volt battery. It's um, AGM absorbed glass mat, um, which is essentially a sealed lead acid battery. But um, instead of the uh, acid being liquid or gel inside, it's absorbed into a fiberglass uh, mat so that it's uh, it won't spill. There's no liquid um, actually inside of it. They can spill out like your car battery can. Uh, here on the side is a uh, a 12 volt um, UPS, uninterruptible power supply. Um, essentially, it charges the battery in, um, and switches over to battery power if uh, you lose AC power. Um, so on the other side of this, actually right over here, a power cord coming around and going out one of the existing holes. Uh, I need to get a cable gland for that. Because right now it's just a you know, just a hole um, coming out the side. So a cable gland and I need to patch these other two holes. I was looking, this cable actually came with the box, uh, with the case. Uh, this is a uh, an ITT Canon connector that fits uh, that connector that's already, the female connector that's already on the case. And it came with this nice, uh, this cable already soldered on. Uh, and I just added the uh, micro, uh, the mini Connex connector. That's everything in the project for now. In the next video, we'll go through the Arduino code and I'll post uh, the code online so uh, you can see how terrible I am at writing code.